Hello and welcome. My name is Dr. Jack West and I'm a medical oncologist in Seattle, Washington and the founder and CEO of GRACE, the global resource for advancing cancer education. This is the question and answer session with Dr. Jared Weiss, lung cancer expert from the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, following his presentation on Highlights in Lung Cancer 2001. Let's start with a question. For patients who are looking into whether they have an ALK rearrangement or could be an EGFR mutation, if they have tissue from several years ago, is it sufficient to go back to tissue from that time or would you routinely recommend getting fresher tissue to assess for an actionable mutation? When tissue is available historically, yes, I do favor using old tissue. There is essentially no risk on doing testing from historic tissue where biopsies do carry risk to them. With modern techniques done by somebody who's skilled, we can minimize that risk. But in oncology, we're always looking to this idea of the likely benefits versus the likely risks of doing something. And that's really quite favorable for historic tissue. And so when tissue is available, I favor starting with the historic tissue. My prioritization is EGFR first, because while ALK is the new exciting kit on the block, EGFR is actually more common. And so when there's limited tissue, I do it first. Now that it's routinely available to get EML4 ALK testing, and that's not sort of asking someone a favor or hunting around for a way to do it, I routinely do EML4 ALK fish second. If there's abundant tissue, and I know that others feel otherwise, I actually am getting KRAS if EGFR and EML4 ALK are negative, and I'm doing it for two reasons. One is to consider which targeted agent trials I might be more likely to recommend a patient to. And the other is because thus far, for most patients, these mutations are mutually exclusive. And so in thinking about whether I'll recommend to a patient to travel or pay for tissue tested for more exotic things, it's helpful to know if KRAS is present or not. Okay, great. A question came out about whether there's anything new that has developed on KRAS mutations in the last year or so. Are we any further ahead with that population, a pretty significant population of patients with non-small cell lung cancer, but we didn't talk about any specific interventions for them. Any headway there? I would answer that with a sort of. I think we have one or two ideas about how to target RAS mutations, but I wouldn't say that we have anything remotely ready for prime time or even a best of as a potential future advance. That canonical signaling cascade that we talk about many times, starting with EGFR, goes from EGR to RAS to RAF to MEC, and I won't confuse everyone by going further downstream from there. But we don't have good drugs that target RAS specifically, but we do have approaches that target things downstream from it and in related places in the signaling cascade that I think may be some part of a best of 2012 or 13 or 14 talk that from a sort of basic science standpoint are promising and some of which have a whiff of clinical data but really nothing that I think I'm ready to treat patients with at this point in time. Jack, if you have a take on any of those agents as being more promising. No, I would have to say the biggest advance is probably that we are looking for tissue so much more readily now than we were even one or two years ago that I think we're identifying more people and segregating based on mutation status. I would say that we're at least remarkably better poised to find differences and some good leads, and there's just growing interest. It's becoming more and more feasible to do trials for much more limited populations because so many more people are getting tested and mobilized based on these molecularly driven trials. But at this point, as you said, nothing yet to direct someone to a specific therapy. Yeah, I'm choosing trials a little bit based on KRAS. I'll look at what's open within whatever geographic area a patient can travel to and consider it for that, but really nothing that you can call a legitimate advance at this time. Also the question, similar issue, have we got any more information about how best to treat patients with an exon 20 or T790M mutation as a mechanism of resistance to epidermal growth factor receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitors? Is there any particular intervention that you would now recommend for them? So for exon 20, to my mind, that data is really still pretty limited. 
on exactly what the different exon 20 mutations mean. Unlike L858R and the other common mutations we're seeing, it's a heterogeneous group that we're just starting to begin to understand. And so for exon 20 specifically, I actually have nothing specific to comment on. But for T790M, I think there is an answer, and I think we talked about it today. I think that the phase one trial of cetuximab and afatinib did look promising for that population. So if you look at this graph, it's color-coded. The red here are the T790M patients. And so you can see many of these patients south of the 0% line with very good responses in here. And actually, this may indirectly address the other resistance mechanisms question in that it did address other things. The blue are T790 mutation negative, so it wasn't there. Yellow are no mutations. The purple are unknown, I believe. But you can see that within what was looked for here, no matter what your mechanism was, this looked like a promising approach. So this approach follows through regardless of T790M. I have a trial that's hopefully opening within the next few months that radiates the resistant clones and then puts patients right back on erlotinib that we hypothesize would work well regardless of resistance mutation. Others are looking at specific resistance mutations and looking to drug them. And so I think regardless of mechanism, both looking specifically at those resistance mechanisms, and then broader approaches like cetuximab, bifatinib, or my trial, I think there's good promise that we'll get there in these different populations. Another question is about some of the other smaller, recently identified targets for the next few years, things like BRAF, HER2 mutation, P10. Are there any of these that have particularly captured your attention and that you would consider to be the ones to watch for highlights of 2012, 13, or 14? Honestly, all of them. HER2 has captured my attention a little bit more recently, and you've written about it on Cancer Grace very recently, but honestly, all of them. When you've identified a mutation that you think is particularly driving a cancer, we've seen repeatedly in lung cancer and in other cancers as well that you just need to find the right way to gum the works of that, and you'll get to an effective therapy. I also think this no-mutation detected group is going to keep shrinking, and I think ROS1 breaking so quickly on the heels of eml 4 out gives you strong reason to believe that that's really true. I'd like to also ask a question that came in about the implications of oncology and particularly thoracic oncology becoming so molecularly based, and that is... Is there growing concern, or do you have some concern, that patients who are being treated by physicians who are in more remote settings are not going to refer their patients for the opportunities for molecular testing and for these kinds of exciting trials that are going to lead to the bigger breakthroughs? Are we going to see more of a potential stratification and loss of opportunities for the people who don't have as good access to molecular testing out of fears of losing patients to the big center? Well, I'm going to take that question in two parts. In terms of the development of molecularly targeted therapies, I think if you look to community oncologists now, I think that they've all gotten pretty savvy to the EGFR story maybe not as uniformly as I would like. But I do believe that the majority of my colleagues in the community are testing for EGFR mutation. I think they're catching on and doing it earlier and earlier in a patient's course, even at diagnosis. And I think that they're prescribing Tarceva in the first line to EGFR mutants. And that gives me hope that they are getting on board to this molecular era. Testing for these mutations is available in even fairly rural community settings not always done on site, but at the minimum is a send out where they send the tissue to a lab that does it. Patients in even very remote areas with insurance, unfortunately, but this testing is widely available, at least for EGFR, KRAS, and I think now in rapid evolution, the eml 4 ALK test. Maybe not as uniformly or as quickly as we'd like, but it's getting there, at least in the United States, to most areas. So for FDA-approved therapies with standardized tests, I actually have good faith in my community colleagues that they're going to get these therapies to patients. The questions about trials in the era of molecular therapy, I can't be quite as optimistic about because we have a long history dating back even in the premolecular era when these were trials of newer, better, less toxic, more effective chemo drugs. 
to say that not as many patients are referred for consideration of trials as we'd like. And that's where advocacy groups and education like Cancer Grace come in to try to encourage patients to seek that a second opinion at a major academic center as early as possible in their course. I really do agree completely, and of course I'm biased on this, but I think that's one of the biggest advantage of the online communities, whether it's the Grace community and website or others, and that is that it gives an opportunity for people from anywhere to learn about the various opportunities out there. It would be great if you didn't have to be a squeaky wheel to get all these opportunities, but the reality is that we do see more potential benefits for patients who seek out more detailed testing and these clinical trials for treatments that may well become the breakthroughs and the highlights of 2013 or 14. But right now, they're still in the earliest trials. So, yeah, I really agree there. Following along on the topic of Tarceva resistance, anything else that you would consider particularly promising in this range of acquired resistance? You covered several of the potential avenues. Is that what you would consider to be the most promising strategies that we've got going for the next year or two? Well, I'm certainly in the top 10 competition for the most biased person to ask that question because I'm spending a lot of my time lately trying to actually get open a study that I've been working on for well over a year to address that question. And of course, I wouldn't be putting all of my time into this if I didn't think that my approach was an exciting one. So forgive the self-reference, but I do think my trial is a good idea. It's built on the observation that unlike patients who progress on chemotherapy, patients who progress with mutation, who progress on erlotinib, don't tend to progress at a very large number of sites. It's not disease exploding. It's typically one to several sites that are more slowly growing while on the drug. Recent years, we've come to understand that that may be due to resistance mutations at those particular sites that may not be present everywhere in the body. We've also learned over the last few years that EGFR mutant cells, including those with the T790M resistance mechanism, are extremely radiation sensitive. The idea of this study is to exploit that radiation sensitivity and advances in radiation, namely stereotactic radiosurgery. And what we're doing is for patients with EGFR mutation who progress while on ERESA or TARSIVA, we're doing stereotactic radiosurgery to the sites of progression that we presume have cells with these resistance mutations. And then we're putting patients right back on TARSIVA for the rest of the lung cancer cells in the body that seem to still be sensitive to the TARSIVA. Just a slight tweak, and that is turning to acquired resistance for crizotinib. It's now emerging as a new issue right on the heels of good treatments for a period of time, but then patients become resistant at some point. And the question is, do we have any actual data yet on how effective any of these treatments might be for second line in acquired resistance after crizotinib? Not really. I don't think any of the patients I'm aware of on these two trials were post-crizotinib. None of them in Dr. Kamage's study were post-crizotinib. They were sort of looking back. What we do have, though, is a specific study of heat shock protein 90 agents going on for the EML4 ALK population who've progressed on crizotinib. So we don't really have that data right now, but I think we will in short order. Right. And actually, I can just speak a little bit to that, that the SINTA trial with gemtespib or STA9090 does allow patients who are either crizotinib, which is also known as Zalcori, naive, or having received it. The concern that I would raise is something I just recently wrote about on the website, and that is that at least looking at some molecular changes that have occurred in a small number of patients who have had their tumors rechecked after acquired resistance have shown that a lot of the patients now have a different driver mutation or have somehow lost their ALK rearrangement, at least below the levels of detection, which would suggest that giving a treatment that is specifically trying to reverse an ALK rearrangement may no longer be the effective way to go. So we'll have to see. That's what I think was so interesting but frustrating about that small number of patients in that study, which was by Bob Doble and colleagues from University of Colorado, was that there was just such a heterogeneity in molecular effects that occurred as patients became resistant. So 
this is getting pretty complex, basically. You had mentioned high levels of MET. Can you speak to how a patient would know this, how it's tested? A patient wouldn't typically know this. As of right now, MET is not clinically tested for. But I can tell you the nature of the test. It's an immunohistochemistry test. In plainer English, when the doctor talks about doing special stains, this is what they're talking about. They're relatively easy tests to do in contrast to, for example, the test for eml 4 ALK, which is a fish, a more complex test, or the mutation test for EGFR mutation and KRAS and some of the others that are typically sequencing, although at some labs a technique called RT-PCR. This is the simple stuff. This is really just how much of the protein is there. Right now, I'm aware of this test only being regularly done for patients trying to get onto the new trial. But should this move forward, it'll be a very, very easy lab test to get to community hospitals and anywhere we want to get it. It's a relatively cheap, easy test. And in fact, I believe that as the drug, MetMab, is being explored, the concept is to develop it in tandem with this diagnostic test not different really from ALK rearrangements as being a cornerstone of the decision of treat or not treat with drugs like crizotinib. So if there is a clinically relevant treatment, the test will become much more readily available. So that's the end of our time here. I would like to thank all of you for participating, especially those of you who added your questions. I hope we were able to provide insightful, useful information for you. I'd also definitely like to thank Dr. Jared Weiss for his time, for his singing, and congratulate him on his engagement. I also want to thank the Longevity Foundation for their partnership, their sponsorship in this program and this whole series. Have a good night, everyone. Bye-bye. Good night. Thanks for listening. If you like and learn from our Grace Cast, you can subscribe on iTunes by just searching for the term Cancer Grace, find podcasts in the subject you want, Pick a format of audio or video, and then just click subscribe. It's that easy. And for those of you who don't want to miss any of our programs, there's even a feed for all subjects. You can also find us on YouTube at Grace for Cancer Info, and that's the number four in one word, Grace for Cancer Info. Finally, if you haven't been there yet, please check out our Grace website at www.cancergrace.org. And don't forget that donate button in the upper right. Our content, which helps tens of thousands of cancer patients around the world every month, is made possible by your support. Thanks again.